and welcome to everyone who is watching. Uh, there is some news out of Washington this morning. There is a bill that is about to be filed uh, in the House of Representatives, uh, which would change the PROMESA law. And if you don't live in Puerto Rico, you're probably thinking, wait a minute, what is that? Uh, if you live in Puerto Rico, you know a lot about it and you care about it. It is the law that was established, um, passed by the Congress in 2016, signed under President Obama. Nobody thought it was perfect, but they thought it was what was needed at that time to get it done. Uh, joining me now live to discuss uh, this bill that would change the PROMESA law is the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee in the House of Representatives, Congressman Raul Rojava from Arizona. Good morning, sir. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you for the invite. Appreciate it very much. So I would like to, sir, if we can, uh, the bill is um, dozens of pages. Uh, I have gone through it and picked out what be the, what is arguably the most substantive uh, and most important to the people who are watching. But before I get to my questions, I want to let you start and tell us your reaction to this day. You took two trips to Puerto Rico. You had two hearings last year. A lot of work has gone into this. Um, what is your reaction for being here and what do you want people to know about the bill? I, I thought your premise at the beginning that uh, the, the, the urgency of the PROMESA Act that Obama signed into law uh, was just that, the, 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 the fiscal crisis that, that, was, uh, that was upon uh, Puerto Rico at the time uh, demanded something and uh, uh, demanded solvency and, and it demanded some action. So uh, that was a compromise. There was a compromise that uh, in a bifurcated government where the, uh, my, uh, my Republican colleagues can control the House of Representatives in the Senate and, uh, and, and the presidency was Obama. And so we came up with this hybrid and essentially putting this oversight board uh, to restructure the debt uh, to set priorities for, for the island and to begin to uh, stabilize uh, the, the economy of Puerto Rico and the fiscal crisis that they were going under. Uh, it wasn't perfect. And, it, and, and as such, when we had the opportunity to be in charge of the committee in the House of Representatives as I did, we began the process of re-examining the law after a couple of years and, and to look at what needed to be reformed within that law uh, in order to make it uh, fair, and more importantly, to really reflect what were the real needs of Puerto Rico. At that time, two things got mixed together, and, and the fiscal crisis and Hurricane Maria, Hurricane Irma, the earthquakes, and now having the, the convulsion of this horrible pandemic that is going on uh, across the world and, and, and affecting all of us. And, and that brought even more stress upon it. And uh, so we visited communities. We talked to representatives of organized labor, uh, students, uh, nonprofits, community-based organizations, government officials, oversight board uh, representatives and, and their directors, and, and, and came, to, came to some conclusions as to what some areas of reform needed to happen in order to make the intent of uh, stabilizing the government and putting in those additional factors of the natural disasters that had occurred and the pandemic into play in, in, in putting this piece of reforms together. All right. So for people who are watching, let is, let's talk about what is going to change should this become law. We will talk about toward the end of the interview what the likelihood is of it in the current political climate. But regarding the bill, what, sir, do you believe is the number one most important thing that you are delivering here for people you've heard from that will change? Well, I think I, I think we define I, I, I think within the within this present uh, what we've, we've, we're submitting today is defining essential services uh, that was kind of left open ended. It was left up to the uh, to the uh, oversight board almost set, uh, entirely. And essential services to me. Uh, were had to do with healthcare for the, for the people of the island. It had to do with the uh, uh, protection and the and, and 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 sustaining the University of Puerto Rico and the education system as a whole on the island. It had to do with protecting pensions. It had to do with uh, with uh, controlling job losses in terms of uh, retaining public employees in in, in their jobs uh, on the island. And so we saw essential services as, as the safety net 
of the human infrastructure issues that were so important to the people of Puerto Rico. Because unfortunately, the oversight board was looking at austerity only as, as its means to deal with the debt and, and deal with, with, with the crisis. And we, we felt that if we cut away those essential services that I just mentioned, uh, that uh, we were essentially making the situation worse and putting a burden on the people of Puerto Rico that was almost impossible for them to sustain. All right, so this law, uh, if it were become law, the bill, would force the board to define essential services. But let me let me ask you this question. One of the things uh, that people will hear in a moment, because I just did an interview with the executive director of the oversight board, and one of the things she said was, my concern is right now we are allocating money where we think it's important, for example, with the Boys and Girls Club of the island, because we think that's an important service. So if we were required to define something as essential, uh, the oversight board's belief is that the creditors would then come in and say, okay, wait a minute, you've defined this as essential, so nothing else, nowhere, give us our money, you don't have any other wiggle room. What's your response to that, sir? I, I think it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, I think, that, that, that the director is talking about. I, when we're talking about essential services, we're talking about the, the basic human infrastructure in any society that that's needed. And it's not only a question of defining what they are, it's a question of prioritizing them as, 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 as you put your fiscal plans together, these must be priorities within, uh, within that fiscal plan. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that there are areas such as healthcare and education and the university and, and, and employment that are not discretionary. And, and, and doing something for the Boys and Girls Club is a good thing. I don't begrudge that at all, but it, 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 and I think that 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 should be uh, something that people uh, uh, protect. But at the same time, we're talking about an overall in human infrastructure package here that is that is more comprehensive than having the discretion to pick which service and which service I don't do. Uh, the the issue for the oversight board. I think the difficulty that they have with, with this defining essential services is that not only do you define it, you make it a priority in your fiscal plan. All right, uh, next point. A lot of people have talked about auditing the debt. Would this bill force the oversight board to audit the debt? Absolutely. I think the, the, that is the, the audit. And, and, I, and we do it with, the, with a commission, with an audit commission, a multi-sector uh, commission, uh, representing the, the stakeholders in, in, in Puerto Rico uh, that, that provides transparency, that looks at the debt, that looks at what is being contracted, what expenditures are going on. We couple that with asking GAO to do the same kind of audits and to make that transparent and available. We, we also include in there the fact that this, there's a disclosure issue, there's a transparency issue where, where the information and, and the priorities and the expenditures are all open and, and, and available to uh, in, in a public format and, and, and to the public. We do that because I think one of the things that you that I saw when I was in the island and felt from the conversations, whether it was the driver that was taking us around or it was the alcaldesa of a, of a given municipio, that the lack of trust, the lack of trust, and I'll let's put it bluntly, the tr no trust in La Punta and the oversight board in terms of what they were doing, their priorities for, for people themselves, and a lack of trust in the central government as well as to how their needs were being met and why it was taking so long to get certain actions done and certain resources to certain places. And so this transparency, this audit is all, all necessary, not just to for the functioning of how we do the fiscal plan and how it's implemented, but also for developing, I think, a level of trust among the people of Puerto Rico that the intention is being carried out. Mr. Chairman, let's go to a, a next major change uh, that would make a lot of people happy on the island. Um, this bill would, correct me if I'm wrong, classify the UPR system uh, as an essential service. Is that correct? Yes. Tell us what that would mean. What would be required? 
would be re would be required is that the institution and its uh, and its function, I believe, is essential. The, the, that that it would be protected, that it would be a priority in terms of resource allocation, and that instead of talking about shrinking that function, you talk about sustaining it and growing that function. In in the economic development of the island, in, uh, you have to retain your talent, you have to educate your talent, and, and you have to promote your talent. And, and the talent is there for that to happen. But you need the institutional framework and you need the institution to do it. And so protecting this asset, this intellectual, academic, and uh, uh, community asset, I think is, is critical. I, 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 the development of any society without having that that educational infrastructure and the higher learning infrastructure so needed in any society, uh, I think would be to so totally detrimental to the development, the economic development of, of the island. You, you have to seed your own and in seeding your own, you develop the talent that is gonna stay there and, uh, and help this island grow uh, to, the full, to the full that it can. Uh, I, I, to me, this is one thing that I have really pitched because I, I, I don't see us being able to talk about economic development, stability, if you have not developed and promoted the talent that's gonna be needed to carry this out. Congressman, you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who doesn't think that the UPR is an essential, uh, is, is essential to um, creating growth uh, and just bettering the island, right? But some people disagree as to whether it should be defined as an essential service under the restructuring project. And one thing the critics would say is, listen, uh, the UPR needs to do a better job of getting alumni money, right? And doing what other universities do in terms of bringing in money that way. And maybe the UPR doesn't need, let's say, 11 campuses across the island. They can do with fewer. That's what some of the critics would say yeah. uh, in terms of defining this. What is your response? That, that, that uh, the university in and of itself is a public institution. And, and, and from talking to students, you saw students from... Uh, all economic sectors of Puerto Rico represented in those groupings. And I think that's the way it should be. It, it, it's, a, it, it's an engine of opportunity and you have to sustain that and you have to make it accessible and you have to make it affordable. And, and, and as a public institution, that's why you protect it. This is, not a, this is not a private institution. This is not a institution that is uh, 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 segmented just for one sector of society. It is a public institution open to all. And as such, I think provides the best, the best uh, opportunity for, for all, 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 all the people on the island. And I, I, I think it needs to grow and I think it needs to be sustained. And uh, I, I defend it as a public institution uh, essential to that island. And as a public institution, it is not going to always be the, uh, the endowment university for Puerto Rico. It is not always going to be the for-profit university that makes money. It is going to be the university that extends opportunity and uh, and works hard to balance its books. But for it to, you know, it's not a profit-making institution. It is an opportunity institution and we have to accept that and, and treat it like a public institution that it is. Let's talk about another major change uh, that the bill would bring about if it were to become law. Uh, it would, correct me if I'm wrong, prevent people who previously worked in the government, served in the government, from being on the oversight board. Is that correct? Absolutely. I think, I think that, uh, you know, we have examples of, you know, former, um, former presidents of the Puerto Rico Development Bank uh, going on to the oversight board and then participating in the restructuring of the debt uh, for, for, that, for that particular bank. Uh, uh, I'm, not, uh, you know, I'm not implying or stating that, that there was something uh, uh, illegal or wrong about that, but I think conflict of interest uh, has to be uh, part of it. And there's strong, uh, strong provisions in there to prevent that both, uh, on the other oversight board and former government employees coming to and working both as consultants having to do with re debt restructuring. Uh, and I think that that's important. Uh, uh, 
that's an, again an important uh, an important mechanism for the people of Puerto Rico to feel that there is some level of confidence and trust that the decisions are that are being made by the oversight board are free of conflict, totally free of conflict, not even the implication of conflict, and that um, the the primary interest is the public interest. And so, yeah, restricting uh, the, that presence on on the oversight board, I think, is a necessary step. Uh, Congressman, someone said to me a short time ago, David, if you were to uh, restrict that, so to speak, and make that applicable, um, you'd be hard pressed to get anyone from Puerto Rico to serve on the board. What would be your response to that? I, I, I think I, I don't agree with that. I, I, I believe that that there is uh, more than than enough people that can uh, that are qualified and able to do that function without uh, carrying the trappings of, of formal employment or a formal position uh, that could draw conclusions or, it, or or implications or appearance of conflict. I, 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 I think the talent, the capacity pool is lot much larger than, uh, than, than what is being implied. Another element of the bill, Mr. Chairman, is that the funding for the board would shift. So right now, the people of Puerto Rico are paying to fund the board but this, but the, the bill would force the federal government to pay that. Uh, why do you believe the federal government should pay uh, rather than the people of Puerto Rico? Based on precedent, when, uh, when uh, Washington, D.C., the city of Washington, D.C., uh, went through its fiscal uh, crisis and its complete restructuring, and a board was put, uh, an authority was put over, uh, local government in order to balance and get out of the debt uh, that was paid by the federal government uh, in its entirety, the function of that board, the staffing of that board, and the expenditures of that board. Uh, same thing happened in Detroit, and the state of Michigan uh, state government paid uh, that cost. And I think it's only fair that this oversight board is a creation of the federal government through the act of Congress and through law. And as such, uh, we should pay the bill under Title III and say this is a, this is a legitimate government federal uh, expenditure and shouldn't be passed down to the people of Puerto Rico. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just went about picking four or so items from this. And by the way, for everybody watching, I will post uh, the entire bill that you can read very legalese. Uh, but I pulled out four <laughs> of the most important. What have I left out, sir, that, that, that you would like to talk about? What else do you think people should know would be some significant changes? That, that we are attempt, the attempt of this legislation and it is to reform an existing law. And part of the criticism is that, that it doesn't go far enough, that there is no need for the oversight board that there is no need uh, for, for the, the heavy hand of the federal government to be involved in the, in the self-determination and decision-making of the people of Puerto Rico to their government. And, 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 and philosophically, I don't have a disagreement with that. I, I, I'm dealing in a world of reality here that this law needs, needs to be changed. It was done at a time when the balance of power was different in Congress. We have an opportunity in the House of Representatives to, to pass a law that would make the process of the oversight board and the, and the federal government's role in Puerto Rico fairer and more equitable to the people of Puerto Rico. That's the effort. And it's not, I'm not even proposing or pro promoting this as a perfect solution, but we're dealing with the reality. The reality is that the, the, the people of Puerto Rico have suffered enough. And when you when you conf conflict the two, you, the natural disasters, the fiscal crisis, the pandemic that we're struggling with right now, the, the people of Puerto Rico as citizens of the United States of America uh, deserve a, a degree of fairness and equity in, their, in how we do this. And this is an effort to try to get at those two. And uh, I, I don't, I will never claim that it's perfect. Uh, some of the things that we had proposed early on uh, we took out of the bill because that was the reaction that we got from people when we were on the island and, and met with all the, all the individuals and organizations that we did. What uh, did you take out of the bill? 
we took out an over a, a coordinator position for everything uh, because it just seemed like another layer on top of the oversight board and uh, they were correct in that assessment they really were uh, and that was uh, I sad, sad to say that was my idea but it was my it was an idea that whose time had not come uh, and I I I also I I learned a lot on, on these trips and, and and one of the things that that I learned I think uh, uh, not only learned but experienced was that you know the people of Puerto Rico have a have a, a resilience and 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 a, and, a, and a real sense of pride uh, about who they are and what their island is and and their vision of the island uh, is is I don't think is being it being realized in the sense that people uh, don't understand that we're talking about uh, a history here in relationship to the United States, about colonization more than anything else, and that our role as a federal government is not to be the overseer, but to be the partner. And and until things change down the road, until that relationship is defined differently, where we are we are trying to make this reforma law uh, less overseer and more partner and that's been the effort and uh, and one of the things that the, the people of Puerto Rico did tell me over and over again is that they just didn't trust that the intentions of the federal government were good intentions and they didn't trust that the intentions of their central government were good intentions uh, and, I, and, and, and working to establish that trust is part of this effort as well. There are four representatives who have signed on to this bill thus far. Representative Darren Soto of Florida, uh, Representative Jose Serrano from uh, New York, uh, Representative Nidia Velasquez, and Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, all of whom are Puerto Rican. Um, are, you, are you signed on to it as well? Yeah. Okay, so, so is, uh, very the, the, the individuals that, that helped a lot with this, all of them, uh, media's ideas are in this bill right. uh, on the audit. Uh, conflicts of interest are Mr. Serrano's points that he pushed very, very hard, and uh, I'm going to miss him terribly. This is his last term in Congress, and I learned a great deal from the dean. Uh, uh, and uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez brings uh, an energy and a, and, a, and a perspective that is needed, and uh, Mr. Soto has been consistent about the economic development questions on there. Mr. Garcia, who represents Chicago and uh, and, and and many uh, many Boricuas from 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 Illinois in his district, uh, has been consistently uh, not only supportive but uh, bringing bringing ideas. This is a combination of a lot of work uh, and uh, and to have the diversity of of members of Puerto Rican members of Congress. Uh, all of them on the bill is 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 uh, is a good thing because. Do you have uh, any Republicans? Do you have any Republicans who signed on? I, I'm I'm hopeful. I, I think we're going to get some some bipartisan support, especially around from Florida and and par uh, parts of New York and uh, maybe some uh, some other parts of the country. There's been interest on the part of colleagues in the past, and uh, we're going to uh, we're going to make a special effort to make sure that happens. I saw that uh, the representative, uh, the rep the resident commissioner from Puerto Rico, Jennifer Gonzalez Colon, is not signed on. Do you know why? I uh, at this point, I don't. I, I, I don't. But uh, you know, we're she is. We're going to have a hearing uh, on this on this legislation, and uh, we will we'll make every effort to make sure that she is uh, full fully engaged. Uh, I, I I think uh, at some point. Um, she'll have to either declare her support or not not support for it. She has done neither, and I'm hopeful that at the end of the day she'll support it. All right, let's talk about the reality here. So the Democrats are in the majority in the House, but the Republicans are the majority in the Senate. Um, you know, Leader McConnell has said, as it pertains to statehood, and I, I maybe this too, he doesn't want to discuss uh, sort of Puerto Rico related issues. Um, and it's unlikely that President Trump would would entertain this. So um, this sort of goes nowhere, so to speak, correct me if I'm wrong, unless there's a change in leadership, right? Well, yeah, we've got, we, my intention is to try to get this 
this legislation in front of the House of Representatives. That's that's the committee's job. That's my job. And 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 and, and I I believe that there's good support on the Senate side. Um, uh, uh, in different portions of it, Elizabeth Warren, uh, others have have indicated strong support for it. But my point is, my point is right now that let's let, let us do our job in the House, establish a template, and say this is what we believe uh, is essential to keeping uh, Puerto Rico on a path uh, to full recovery from the fiscal crisis and full recovery from the natural uh, disasters and the pandemic. Let's let's do that. I think I think there is popular support for that in the House. Uh, we'll, we'll do our job. And then uh, I think the, the responsibility uh, and, and the pressure then shifts to the Senate. Uh, you know, the words from McConnell have not been uh, encouraging. And, and the president's uh, attitude toward Puerto Rico is always in question. Uh, but the fact that this is of urgency, and now you couple that with what this country is going through, the mainland's going through, the islands going through with this pandemic. And I think it just adds additional urgency and momentum to, to trying to get something done. Okay. Um, Representative Grijalva, I appreciate your time. Thank you for that. Thank the you very much. Very kind, David. Yes, sir. So thank you. Uh, just so everyone uh, watching knows, the, the next step is to take this to committee. Uh, it'll be voted on the committee. Once it comes out of committee, then it would go to the full house uh, and then on and then on from there. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Pleasure. So what I'd like to do now is I would like to show you all a video of an interview that I did a short time ago. Uh, this was done with the um, executive director of the Puerto Rico Oversight and Management Board. Her name is Natalie Jeresco. Uh, she was not able to join us live uh, because she had a pre-scheduled event. So this interview was taped a short time ago. So. I'm going to enable screen sharing here and let you all listen to the interview that I did with Ms. Jeresco a short time ago. We remain committed to working with the chairman, with the ranking member, the members of the committee uh, to continue oversight over implementation of PROMESA, but I believe that Parts of uh, the draft legislation, as I read it today, uh, could actually uh, not be in the best interest of Puerto Rico and the people of Puerto Rico. In what way? So I'm, uh, I welcome compliance. I, I, re I welcome transparency. I welcome uh, the, the language on conflicts of interest and, and uh, creating more transparency there. All right, so let me back this up. Apparently, you guys are not able to see it. So let me see what I'm not doing right. Share that. Today, uh, could actually uh, not be in the best interest of Puerto Rico and the people of Puerto Rico. I know you guys can hear it because I'm listening to it on so, the. Uh, I welcome compliance. <laughs> I'm listening to it on the Facebook live stream, but I'm trying to figure out how to stream it from here. Do do. Hmm. All right, so guess what? You could hear it, right? Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Since you can hear it, I'm going to go ahead and uh, play it again, because at least you can hear it, that's better than nothing. Uh, I'll get the video fixed next time. I'll do better. Uh, it's a one-man show here, folks. So I will get the video fixed and figure out how to do it on my end. But for the time being, I want you all to listen uh, to what she said. This is when I went to her for her response to what the bill says. By the way, she was given a copy of the bill last night as a courtesy by the Natural Resources Committee. So uh, here is Natalie Juresco. That is the audio which you will hear now. 
So um, we remain committed to working with the chairman, with the ranking member, the members of the committee, uh, to continue oversight over implementation of PROMESA. But I believe that parts of uh, the draft legislation, as I read it today, uh, could actually uh, not be in the best interest of Puerto Rico and the people of Puerto Rico. In what way? So I'm, uh, I welcome compliance. I, I, rec I welcome transparency. I welcome uh, the, the language on conflicts of interest and, and uh, creating more transparency there. But I believe that the definition of essential services, the way that the legislation moves to define essential services, could in fact play into the hands of creditors who are trying to limit and reduce the amount of spending here in Puerto Rico. Give us an example of how that would do so. So the law currently says that the board needs to ensure the funding of public of essential public services, which we believe we have done. But if you start to define the essential services too narrowly, the or, or define them in general, what you could expect is that creditors will go and litigate this issue in court to define whether or not something is essential. So for example, I mean, is a full-time legislature an essential services? Only four states in the United States have full-time legislatures. Is ha having new University of Puerto Rico certainly essential, but is having 11 campuses essential for a hundred mile wide island? That'll be debated in a court. And you leave that definition then to the court, to the uh, lawyers to, to litigate. Um, I think you know you, you you look around and you say, is a hundred are 110 agencies for a 3.2 million population essential, or could it be less? So I think I think we lose track. We, we end up litigating for a long period of time, spending a great deal of legal dollars um, on on an issue which isn't really the critical issue. The, the critical issue is have we or have we not funded what's essential? And we believe we have public safety, public health. Um, public education, and I think that's the, the critical element. I think throwing this into the courts to further litigate the definition will be problematic and not good for the people of Puerto Rico. Do you understand when the chairman says, and those who have signed on to the legislation thus far say, uh, the decision and the law not requiring thus far that essential be defined has caused problems? I, I think they're focused on one element of people who believe that more money should go towards a particular public service, but they're not focused on the broader issue, which is that, for example, currently um, the budget allows for, uh, appropriately, I believe, uh, su support for the Boys and Girls Club in Puerto Rico, which does extraordinary work in communities throughout the island. Um, do, do, do we want to leave to the courts to litigate the definition of whether or not that boys and girls club support is essential? I don't, I don't think that they're focused on the other half. And I think that um, what we need to be certain of is that the public service is being delivered to the people of Puerto Rico and we need to focus on implementation. That's where I think we need to focus the attention. You bring up the UPR it would be defined as an essential service if this were to become law and change the PROMESA law as we know it. What's your reaction to that? I don't disagree that UPR is essential. I think, that, again, the judgment goes into how do you strengthen UPR? And if UPR was enjoying a 70% subsidy up until uh, PROMESA, as compared to most state universities getting 20, 30% of their budget, what did that do to UPR's management? I mean. Did they seek out and are they fair with revenues and, and diversifying their revenue base, which is the goal. The goal isn't to reduce it and harm UPR. The goal is to strengthen UPR. So number one, why not seek out donations from your alumni? Every university does that. Um, why not um, have a tuition that is higher for those who can pay, who are paying, in fact, private high schools prior to entering UPR or at other uh, private universities on the island, a higher level, but provide scholarships for everyone who has a means need uh, or a means tested need. So no one would be barred from going to UPR for financial reasons, but UPR would increase its tuition for those who can pay. Subsidize those who need support. Don't subsidize to everyone. When you have to allocate resources and prioritize, that's not how you want to prioritize the use of the resources. So I think for UPR, which is the jewel, it is the jewel of the education system here. Why not increase the number of students that you attract out of state, out of territory from the mainland to come to UPR for that jewel of an education from Latin America, from the Caribbean? Charge out of state tuition. Increase the portion of 
the utilization of the university to bring in other students to benefit and who will leave forever with Puerto Rico in their hearts, if not stay on the island themselves. What's the one critique you hear from people who arguably will support what this amended law would do? What's the one thing they say that you disagree with? The guaranteeing 800 million or more, which is what the legislation does, will actually help UPR develop. I don't, I don't believe it will. I think that that level of, of support causes UPR not to focus on strengthening itself for the future. It makes it reliant in a way that is worrisome and potentially puts it in a situation where when and if the Commonwealth can't afford 800, it doesn't know how to adapt to the situation. It makes it less flexible, less adaptable. Uh, in terms of auditing the debt, this new one of the amendments would force the debt to be audited. A lot of people have wanted that from members of Congress, uh, both Republicans and Democrats, and people on the island. Your reaction? But that was the purpose of the Cobra and Kim report that the board spent almost two years on, millions of dollars hiring a third party to review the debt, to go through all of the, the issues related to that debt. And that report, which is in English and Spanish, available on our website, more than 600 pages of review of the debt, is what led to the board and I believe the Unsecured Creditors Committee challenging the issuance of some of the debt, the 2012 general obligation bonds, the 2014 general obligation bonds, and other. And it provided that legal basis to do that. So I, I, I believe that doing another audit, which will cost a substantial amount of money again, will repeat the process we've already gone through. And at best, will it will provide the same basis to go into court with, with, with which we've already done so, is duplication of effort and delay in getting Puerto Rico out of bankruptcy. Regarding the conflict of interest, uh, this has been something that, you know, both sides have agreed to. Listen, for everybody watching, uh, when PROMESA was passed under President Obama, no one said they loved it, even the president didn't love it, but they said it was what they thought was needed at the time to get it done. Um, everybody had something they would have tweaked. As it pertains to conflict of interest, my understanding is one of these amendments, tell me if you think I'm wrong based on your reading of it, but it would basically say if you've worked in the government, you can't work on the board going forward. Is that how you understand it? Yes, it, uh, it has implications for the next board for certain. And your reaction? Again, it, 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 it has implications for the next board. It will limit um, to a large extent, you know, which Puerto Ricans can serve on the board because Puerto Ricans uh, it is a small community and many Puerto Ricans have served in the, in the government, have contracted with the government, have uh, worked on the sidelines or with the government. And so that, that narrowing of the field narrows the field for Puerto Ricans to represent um, their interests on that board. But that is something that if the, if the Congress decides to move forward, the implications are for the next board and they will have to be implemented. So for the record, it wouldn't affect those currently serving? Well, the, the term of these board members has expired already. And um, the, these, these members are on their way to um, being replaced at some point, although we're not certain of what that process will be in the timing. But this board's term has already expired. I only have one other question. Is there something else you, I mean, I, I, I picked the big chunks that I think are gonna be the most interest to folks. Is there something else you saw that interests you that you would like to uh, react to? So I think there's um, some concern that the board has expressed previously, and it remains in this draft legislation on the relief for the unsecured public debt. So the, the idea that, that, that um, the Puerto Rico legislature could discharge, could eliminate uh, all the unsecured financial debt um, for no payment, uh, I, think, I think it is a highly risky approach. And what the risk is, is that by, by allowing Puerto Rico to do that, in the future, capital markets will view Puerto Rico as a risky issuer. And what does that mean? I, I, I don't know if that means uh, that they will never be able to borrow again. I probably wouldn't go that far, but at what cost would Puerto Rico ever be able to borrow knowing that the Puerto Rico legislature at any time could discharge? If it was just a one-time discharge, perhaps they'd be able to borrow, but at a very high cost because of the implied risk. If it's to be able to discharge at any time, then they won't be able to borrow at all. And not borrowing for Puerto Rico in the future means not investing into infrastructure, not investing into capital, not investing into technology. And I think that that would be a huge loss for Puerto Rico. When you say discharge, you mean? Cancel, the way the legislation reads, cancel the debt. 
cancel the obligation to pay the creditors what they are owed under the debt that was issued. And I, I believe that's what the bankruptcy process is for, to come to a negotiated court settlement on what is payable, what is not. But if you just discharge the debt, um, I think you're creating, you know, it would be a first in all municipal, municipal bonds in history of the United States. And it would be a, <clears throat> it would be detrimental to market access for certain. Okay, so that is Natalie Juresco. She is the executive director for the Puerto Rico Oversight and Management Board. Uh, if you were just joining us before Ms. Juresco, we heard from Congressman, Congresswoman, uh, Congressman <laughs> Raul Grijalva, who's the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee. Natural Resources has the um, jurisdiction over the territories. And so it is the Natural Resources Committee that is putting forward uh, this bill that will be filed with the House of Representatives. It's got to go before the committee. It'll be voted on there. Then it goes to the floor of the House, you know, some way, somehow, maybe in another bill that it gets passed through in or its own standalone. Um, but I just wanted to give you guys uh, a little appetizer as to what it says. It's a lot of reading and it's a lot of confusing reading written by really smart people who write in legalese terms. So what I'm going to do uh, later today, let me look at the clock. It's 1056 coming up on 11. So what I will do is when I get a copy of that, I will post it here so you can read for yourself. Um, again, this is a tall, it's a mountain to climb, right? Because, um, the critics will say this is going to go maybe nowhere in the Senate, and uh, that means it's virtually going to go nowhere for now unless there's a new president in the White House or unless the Democrats take control of the Senate. Uh, could that change? Who knows? Could there be some surprises and people across the aisle uh, who agree to some of these changes? Maybe so. So um, I hope this was helpful in at least getting people interested to want to know and read more. It's not often that bills uh, make a lot of news, but I know how important uh, this issue involving PROMESA is to people on the island uh, who are rejected, who are against it, those who favor it, even though they don't think it's perfect. And so wanted to give you a little guy, you guys a, a little heads up as to what is happening today. Again, the filing may have actually already happened. I was told it was going to be done between 1045 and 11 a.m. So when I've got the actual link, I will share it with you and you can read for yourself. OK, uh, just for everybody watching, I am going to be doing another Facebook Live probably in about 45 minutes with the Secretary of Parks, I believe it is in Puerto Rico, uh, to talk about what people need to know regarding restrictions and those things that are allowed uh, moving forward. So the governor amended her executive order and you can now go to the beach, but there are rules about what you can and can't do. So just to make it clear to the English speaking audience who maybe, you know, didn't understand the governor's speech or haven't gotten the translation from that. Uh, we will run through some of those details leading into the weekend. Okay, we'll see you soon.